think we might be live. Let me see here. Watch myself get on the screen. Okay, I think we're in. And there's a commercial. Wonderful. All right, so we got about four minutes before I'm going to get started. And uh, so I will be in the chat if you want to talk to me. Looks like we have somebody here. So should be quite an adventure we're in for. More for me than for you, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. I think it'll be fun. What should we do in the meantime? Got about three minutes. What do I got here? A game to play. Oh. Solitaire. And they upgraded the graphics with the for Windows 7, looks like, huh? I'm gonna win. Just what you came to see. <laughs> Three minutes. It's gotta be something more interesting. You know, something about twenty times more interesting. There we go. Now we're talking. Oh man! All right, I got this. I go. Oh no, no, not there. Oh, lost. Two minutes. Uh, which one? Uh, oh, I just guessed there. It's your fastest time here. Oh. Still two minutes left. Gotta get all these games in while I still can. What do we got here? No, nope, that's not one. Oh, 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 uh, gotta make a guess. No, it's not that. Uh, there we are. And. Yes. Alright, we got one minute left, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, Get some things started here. You don't have to watch me play solitaire anymore. It's making pretty good progress, so. Oh boy, you want me to broadcast my own commercials? That'd be pretty nice. Sorry, still getting used to this. So yeah, the chat, I will be trying to monitor the chat. So if you are uh, if you have any questions, then feel free to ask them. I'll try to try to uh, answer them to my best, the best of my ability. I got nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. So before we get started, I got to preface this with, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how deep to go with the programming stuff. I'm going to try to keep everything at a, uh, kind of give you a, a feel for, you know, how I look at, at uh, this this project. Uh, Run UO, of course, is the, the open source emulator for Ultima Online that you can go and download right now if you wanted. You could, um, I, I, I don't know if you can still get the rail pour code from a long time ago uh, out there publicly, but... Um, at one point, we put it out there for everybody after we closed down the server. 
but anyway, uh, you know, obviously we're we're uh, thinking of uh, rebooting Railpore, and it's going to involve a lot of new stuff. So won't have won't have it in the old code. But uh, what I have and what I'm going to be working with today is is the current uh, repository of code for the new Railpore that's in the works. And so I want to run in, uh, run over it with you a little bit, kind of show you how RunUO works underneath the hood a little bit, and uh, and from there, we're going to just uh, start programming some of uh, a new loot table system that I think is going to be superior to what RunUO has in it. Not that RunUO stuff doesn't work, but it's just really hard to maintain, uh, hard to add new stuff. You always have to do a server reboot if you want to change what an orc spawns with and stuff like that. Um, you can, uh, So we want to make it a little bit more flexible, and uh, I think it'll, it'll turn out really well. So anyway, so let's get started. Let me kind of give you a, a real quick overview of what happens when you start running the server. Um, here is the core project. So, so the way RunUO is actually, uh, there's tons of files in here. The way RunUO, vanilla RunUO is parsed out, there's two projects that come with it. There's a core and the, the shard project. Uh, the core project, this is Visual Studio, by the way, if you haven't, uh, there's a you can get a free version of Visual Studio. It's a really great uh, development environment if you want to do any programming. Highly recommend it. In fact, there's two particular shortcuts that you really need to know uh, if you want to kind of look through code and, and figure out what's going on with it. So uh, it's it's an indispensable tool. I mean, you could actually literally open this code in Notepad and start to program in Notepad, you know, Windows Notepad. Code is just a text file, basically, um, and it would work. But you know, this uh, integrated development environment is what it's called. Uh, Visual Studio makes it so much easier, and I'm going to kind of show you a little bit of how how it makes it easier to follow how how the code executes. So anyway, um, the core is what actually runs when I say start. If I were to run the program, the the server program. The, it's going to look into the core project into a particular file that we set up as uh, as the starting point. The reason it's the starting point actually is because it has a special function in it called main. It's not because this this class is called main. It's because there's a special function in it called main. And we've pointed the project to uh, be this. This is the uh, the starting point. Um, that uh, basically when you say go, this is where you want to enter the process. Now what, what happens when you run a program? It's really actually quite straightforward. It starts to execute the commands that you tell it to execute in the order that you tell them to execute. And so if we open this main.cs file, cs is for C sharp, that's the programming language you were using. Uh, programming languages, there a lot of them are very similar to each other. Um, if you know uh, Java, you'll probably be able to learn C sharp really easily. If you know C plus plus, you can learn C sharp really easily. So let's look at what's in this main uh, program. This is this is essentially what what uh, where the starting point of the entire server is. Okay, basically at the top you have a class definition. Now you can think of a class like um, when you think of a class of uh, like a category, you know, a category of objects. So a human is a class, and it's a it comes out of the a mammal. You know, I don't know the object. Basically, the class defines a bunch of properties that um, that are similar across all instances of the class. So I'm a I'm an instance of a human. So in the, here you might have a bunch of properties like my name, my name is Alan, my address. Um, so these are properties basically of the core class. The core class is the object that contains the core, everything that, that the base running environment for the server. Okay. So there's a bunch of properties in, on this base running environment, right? And uh, we don't really need to go over all of them, uh, but you can see there's a boolean. A boolean is a true or false value of whether or not it's crashed. So when it crashes, it probably sets that value to true and uses that in the logic to figure out what to do. Um, you have the base directory. Where in the file system am I? And, it, and that's important, and we're actually going to use that when we uh, do our own programming. <coughs> um, so there's a, a lot of a lot of things that you essentially uh, this object, this core object, has to keep track of, and those are called properties. And these are all the properties 
that we have to deal with. Um, so it actually there's a lot, right? You can see how many there are. Uh, we got a, a question. I'm curious what is used for the database persistent storage, if you want to speak uh, some more about that at some point. Sure, I can speak on that. Um, I think we'll get around to it. Remind me if, you, if I don't um, at some point. Uh, but, but yeah, we can talk about that. So, or, yeah, if you uh, know the answers, feel free to chime in on the chat. Okay, so we're still looking at uh, the property getters and setters. There's things that make it easier uh, essentially to track. So the core, if, if I wanted to change this base directory property from the outside, um, I want the core object to know that it changed. So, so there's some tricks that you can do by, uh, it's some, some coding technique uh, to, to use. They're called getters and setters that allow you to essentially know or, or notify and uh, respond when one of your properties has changed. If you don't use getters and setters and some, somewhere outside there, like I have an orc, and for some reason the orc wants to change a property on the core object, then you uh, basically would, you could do it directly. If you had access to it, you could do it directly, and the core object would have no idea that that property has changed. And that could really bite you if, uh, if you're not careful. So anyway, there's, so there's some tricks going on here. Um, there's a, our first function we've encountered, but I want to get to the main function because the main function is where everything starts and things happen, right? So I'm going to go through real quick, and again, I, I uh, don't want to get too bogged down. You could spend, you know, entire semesters of school going over all the programming principles involved here. But uh, just to give you an idea of what happens when you execute this program. And Visual Studio is very, very cool because it has what's called a debugger. The debugger lets you run line by line through the code and see exactly what's, what's happening at any moment. And you can even, so this uh, red dot that I put on there is a breakpoint, allows you to stop the, the program execution at that line. And you can even look and see what the current state of my properties are. You know, what, what are the, uh, you know, all the variables? What, what is the state of my program right now? Uh, it tells you uh, exactly what's, what's happening at that moment. Very powerful tool that you have to, if you're going to get serious about programming, you really need to get... Uh, get familiar with. So I'm going to hit start. You can see that here this window popped up. And uh, this window is my server. It just barely started entering this function. So it actually hasn't done anything yet. And I'm going to actually kind of run through this quickly. So you can see um, I'm adding a, a function response basically when there's an unhandled exception, an unhandled exception basically just means that something was not, something was done that was not allowed. Like I have a group of objects that's only 10 elements long and I tried to access the 11th element. The program would realize, wait, I can't do that. There's no 11th element and it would throw, it's called throwing an exception and that exception would eventually be handled at some point. And if it doesn't get handled, if I don't code it to handle it, then it will reach the essentially the base of my program and and the the uh, the program will realize wait I don't have a handle for this I don't I haven't handled this problem and it will then execute this pro this function current unhandled exception um, now if you're in Visual Studio F12 does the same thing as right clicking here and go to definition so when I do that this is one of the two things that you really need to know how to do if you want to kind of poke through code and see what's going on. When I go to that, it shows me that this is what happens when I have an unhandled exception. It writes to the console. And what is the console? That's this window. It writes this message. It says it's either an error or a warning, depending on whether the unhandled exception object is terminated or not. So if it has to close the program, then it will if it has to close the program, it's going to say error. If it doesn't have to close the program, it's going to say warning, and so on. And just runs through all this code step by step and exits when it hits that end bracket, the end bracket corresponding to this function. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of uh, that's what would happen if there was an unhandled exception. So I'm going to start stepping through. So you can see there's a uh, process exit handler. 
So when the process exits, I'm, I navigated to the definition by pressing left F12, same thing as if I went go to definition, then it's going to call this handle closed function. Well, it calls this function first, and then it calls handle closed. And what does handle closed do? Well, let's see what it does. If it, it enters, if it's closing, meaning that that property, the closing property, has been set to true, which it probably hasn't yet, uh, then it it returns, so it stops right there. It, it does not complete the rest of the function. Otherwise, it sets it to true. It writes a message to the console, so you'll see up printed here exiting. It'll do this world dot wait for wait for write completion. When I say world dot, that means it's going to run a com a function on the world class. So we can navigate to that function by highlighting this, pressing F12, and it takes us to that function. What does that function do? It says it uh, has this m this disk write handle. The m underscore means member variable, so it's like a private variable only only having to do with this particular world class that no one from the outside world needs to know about. Basically, uh, no 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 function or class from the outside world needs to know about. And it would uh, call the wait one function on it. Anyway, we don't have to dig that far, but you can get, get, kind of get the idea of how you can follow the code in uh, under the hood and see what what's happening. Um, you, you need to learn, of course, a little bit more about C Sharp if you really want to get into it. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's like learning another language in a way. You'd have to practice, but it's really fun because you can really tweak some things. And I'm going to show you some stuff uh, how how it works in the near future here. So anyway, so before it closes, before it exits the process, the process is the the program running on your computer. I have, for example, this task manager. The Windows Task Manager, all these processes. I have the X split. That's my broadcaster, you know, running. So before it actually leaves the process, my program will call this function, which is really nice. I can do some stuff before it leaves. And essentially, it, what it that function does is, if it's in the middle of a save, it finishes a save and then it's done. So anyway, let's get back to running through the server boot. Okay. So I'm going to press F10 is to step over. That's the next step. So it's going to do a for loop. A for loop basically iterates, uh, it just counts. Um, depending on, well, you can program it to, to do kind of whatever at each step, each time it gets to the end of the loop. But this one in particular start, has this indexer variable named i. starts at 0. You add 1 every time you get to the end of the loop until this is false. This i is less than args at length. Args are passed in. Uh, to the program, you can pass in a lot of different, uh, basically a string of, uh, so in this case, it's passed in the debug string. This is the string. You could actually run this program from the command line if I wanted to. So here I have a command line. If I was in the right directory, I would call run uo dash debug. And what would be in this args variable by the time I reach this point is debug just like that. Anyway, it finds that this particular argument that we're on does equal debug, so it says this equal or m debug uh, variable to true. In any case, you see we're just following the code. We hit the end of the for loop because args at length is only one, and so we come down here to this try and catch. Try basically, you know, I talked about those exceptions. Try uh, statements everything within the brackets of a try statement, um, then if there's an exception, you can catch that exception before it comes up to the top and it's unhandled and then you can handle it in this catch uh, uh, block here. So if there was a problem in the code, in this code, I could handle it and not break the program basically. So that's what the try and catch is for. Anyway, we're going to step through. Um, the service mo uh, is whether I think it's whether or not it's running it as like a Windows service, which is in the background, so you wouldn't even have a console. Anyway, um, it's not running as a service, so it's not going to do that. So it's going to set all these other properties. You remember this at the very beginning of the core class. I hit F12 to to go to the definition of this process variable, and here I am back at the beginning of the of the core class, and so. Again, I'm going back to where I was. So this is where that, that variable is being set to something. And it's being set to the current process, which is the running program. So 
Um, the thread is threads are really useful for doing thi a lot of things at once. Uh, a given thread is basically well, we're in a given thread. We're in a thread right now, um, running particular commands. Um, and the if you want, you can actually create another thread. And at the very same time, especially on the multi-core processes, which practically everyone has now, you can run stuff at the same time. The problem is that when you try to when you have this thread over here trying to access the same spot in memory as this thread, or changing what's in memory there, then and this thread then needs something from that me from a spot in memory, things can get messy. So anyway, um, there is some multi-threading going on in RunUO, um, and you'll see a little bit of that. I'll show you. Uh, we're not actually too far away from the end of this function, actually. Uh, but we'll show you. It gets a little... <laughs> you, you can dig down. The, the rabbit hole goes pretty deep, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if to really get started, and I'm going to show you again, you know, a particular thing that I have in mind that I want to build in RunUO uh, and integrate with RunUO, you know, it's uh, it's pretty uh, fun to do and it's not super hard because the way they've built everything. Um, so, so anyway, it's if you're interested in it, it's it's a fun thing. I actually got into into it only a couple, um, probably what three years ago now. Just as a hobby, I had an idea of something I think would be fun to, to put in there, and I started getting into it. I knew how to program before that, but um, I learned C Sharp just kind of on the, the fly. I knew Java before, but yeah, you can you can do it if you're really interested in it. So anyway, let's get going. Um, so the thread's name, we're going to set uh, the base directory. It's basically set the current directory where I am in the file system. You can see here, and then the C drive, real poor, all that, whatnot. Um, so there's a timer thread. The timer thread is a special thread that uh, is running concurrently. So it's it's always running, spinning its wheels, trying to run uh, the uh, basically it's checking whether or not a timer is is ready to tick. Right? If the timer ticks, then it's time to do something, and that's what that thread's doing on the side. So while I'm executing the, my code in in this main thread, the timer thread's running all the time, checking is it time. To execute this, this uh, is it time to regenerate your mana point? Is it time to uh, to have the artificial intelligence think of the next step? Right. So that's the timer thread. Um, it's going to run. I'll write all this console stuff. Get my processor count. I have eight processors on this computer. It's kind of cool. From a in a program, it's easy to to figure out how many processors I have. Uh, it is multiprocessor. It's 64 bit as well. This, if you hover over it, you can see is 64 bit is false. Um, so anyway, let's see. I have a few messages here. Alan is good looking. Thank you. Show us the old account file. So you want to see all the names and passwords? <laughs> you know the account file is actually stored. Uh, let's see. I think I've deleted everything, but my password. It, it puts in uh, cryptographic terms so you can't actually see it. This is a this is the save file of the accounts. So if you're, it, it flattens it all into an XML file. So this would have hundreds and hundreds of accounts on the original save file. Right now I, on, I only I'm using a, I, I basically deleted all the accounts that were already on there. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so let's keep going. So it's checking the platform whether or not it's Unix, it's not Unix, it has a console event handler. This stuff handles, I'm, I'm navigated to it again, so I double clicked it and pressed F12. Um, apparently you can, if you do a control C, I think is the log off event, or maybe that's a kill event. Anyway, it runs that code, the kill code, which runs the handle closed function, which I showed you earlier, so that it finishes the save, if it's already saving. So again, you can kind of follow the the logic, even if it's really daunting at first, you follow it one step at a time. And I, I'm sorry, I won't disable the encryption. <laughs> all right, so um, the garbage collector, you don't really need to know about that. That's all kind of in the background. Okay, so this step, it actually, the way RunUO is built is kind of interesting. They built it with this core project, and then they have this scripts project. And the core project actually, um, Basically, when you run the program, the core program, which I'm in right now, 
it goes into the scripts project and compiles everything. Normally, so when I say compile, it takes your your text file, which you built maybe in Notepad. It doesn't matter, and it and it compiles it into ones and zeros commands that the the computer can actually understand. Okay, so it uh, so every time you run this program, it actually tries to see if it needs to compile this script folder, and it compiles it right there, like. Run UO includes the the compiler in it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean your your computer has a compiler on it, but anyway, it runs the the code necessary to compile those scripts as you run the program, and then it starts to reuse those scripts. It's kind of neat how they did it. I think there, though, at the same time, if when you're using um, Visual Studio, you don't really need that because you can compile it and then run it anyway. So you sometimes compile things twice if you don't have it set up right. But anyway, long story short. Uh, it, it's interesting that they did that, and I think the reason that they did that is because they want you, if you're interested in changing this run UO stuff, to only uh, touch the script, not touch the core. Why? Because the core, I think they figure that they would update the core and want you to get the latest version, but if you're always tweaking things like I do, because um, as soon as you figure out exactly how things are working, and you can, then it might conflict with the updates that they've made and obviously that actually does happen you know and uh, so we're, you get kind of stuck on this older version of the core which turns out is can be okay but anyway so the script compiler you invoke um, the, the script compiler class oh, so it actually has in it the ability to call functions on uh, on all these things that just compiled and one of those functions is called configure. And configure basically uh, any any class that I have. So let's say I don't know if the mobile class has configure. It doesn't. Does it have initialize? No, it doesn't. I think my pseudo seer code. I I don't know if you guys remember or if anyone here play that played before remember the pseudo seer system. I know that I. So here's the initialize function. It's a public static function, meaning it can be reached without an instance, I guess, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to save, uh, again, you can go real deep with all these programming concepts, but uh, still giving you an overview here, but anyway, any any class that has this initialize function, if you create something, and we will, when I, you know, when we get into my actual coding, um, that has this initialize function in it, it'll run this code at the moment that my main function uh, hits the script compiler dot invoke initialize. Okay, so the moment I hit this, in fact, we could put a breakpoint. Let's do it just to show you that, that I'm not crazy. <laughs> well, uh, I think the jury's still out on that one, but um, so I'm gonna come down to the initialize world dot load. So these uh, region dot load and world dot load is loading all the regions, like the dungeon regions and the spawn regions and stuff that run you kind of comes built with. The world.load is where it actually goes through the save files. Uh, someone asked how it's how the persistent storage works. Um, so here, it starts to go through the load function. I, I navigated to the load function. I press F12. So let me go back and do that again because this is a very important concept that you need to know. Double click it. You can right click it. Go to definition or press F12. So now I can see what what happens when you load and it comes down and it grabs here the mobile index path those are the mobile that's the binary file that's actually opening here and reading that has all the properties that have been serialized when I say serialized it means that it's been taken from uh, its binary format uh, you know I have my character his name's Alan right he has the name named Alan and I've taken that name and I've put it into binary and put it I've serialized it so I put it into a file format that I can then deserialize later and it sounds more complicated than it really well it actually is a little bit complicated because you have to basically know exactly the order that it was put into the file when I say serialize it means basically put into a line right so you have an infinite line that you're you're adding data to you need to know exactly what order it was added otherwise you wouldn't know what you know what this nonsense binary stuff means. Uh, so anyway, 
obviously it's very important as if you're doing run UO programming I can show you the serialize and deserialize functions later on some of our custom uh, mobs like a, like a Balron for example but anyway it's very important that that it's serialized in the right order otherwise you'll you won't get you know, the right stuff out in fact it, it won't even boot it'll be like oh there's a problem uh, I didn't know understand why why uh, you know I I, re I read this variable and I was expecting a number and it's this you know garbage and anyway so I hit this initialize I'm gonna run from there and look I hit my breakpoint in this creature possession file which was you know not really associated with this main file anywhere but yeah so this this function this invoke function goes through every single class in my script and runs this initialize function if it exists and in this case it does exist so it's going to register all these commands that um, that allow you to do pseudo seer stuff like adding a pseudo seer or possessing a, a mobile right so anyway that's a uh, that's what happens when you hit initialize. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here so we can continue and see the end here. We're almost to the end actually of of this function. The end is right here. Okay, we've almost made it. This is the entire entirety of the Run UO server running right here. Though again, you can go deep into every single function that's being called here. The timer thread it wants to start it obviously so that it's actually running in the background. Um, it goes through all the maps, forces tiles. I'm not sure what that does offhand. We could look at it if we wanted. Uh, basically, uh, I'd have to look into that more, but nothing that important. I'm going to put a breakpoint here and hit play, continue. So I've skipped that for loop because it might take a little while to go through every loop. And invoke server started, that's the cause of function. So here we are while m signal wait one so that has to do with multi-threading so I'm, this is my main thread and there's basically a signal that signifies that something has changed that you need to actually do something with so anytime a timer ticks on the timer thread over here it's running independently they don't know what they're doing but there is a signal basically the timer thread sets on my main thread that says something something needs to be updated then as soon as that hits um, it's going to it it will enter this loop and it'll, or it will enter this block of code and run it. So it processes the delta Q. The delta Q is every change basically that's been made. So if I hit you and you took 15 damage, then there was a delta. Delta means change, right? And it's going to then process every delta that ha occurred and send out updates to every client that can see that delta. So if I was on the screen with you, uh, and you hit me then you need to know that I was hit right so that's that's where that happens the item delta Q is the same thing so suppose I moved an item to a new place same thing um, timer slice is basically this is asking the um, the timer thread to run through uh, all of all of its things that it's that it's queued up basically as it as it's running by itself over here it queues up messages of of uh, timer events so the, your mana regeneration it will handle all of those events in this slice function message pump is where it's actually received messages from every client it runs through every received message and the slice function processes every message so you tried to move it runs through it or it finds that message eventually and it enters uh, and it, it tries to let you move and if you fail to move it'll send a rejection net state flush all this is where it sends all the messages that it has prepared to send all the packets is prepared to send process dispose queue basically all the the net states they've disconnected it uh, disposes of and that's it and it just keeps running through that loop over and over looking for timer events looking for um, looking for changes um, I and then uh, sending out all the messages, receiving the messages, handling the messages, sending out more messages. That's the, that's all there is to Run UO. So in half an hour, we ran through what Run UO was. Uh, could have probably done a little faster, but I think what, I think it's a pretty good overview. And I think uh, you know if if you're interested in uh, in doing anything really cool with it, you know. 
it's it's really neat to dive into and see what's going on. So now the question, uh, what do we do? Um, how, for example, does a ball round work? So why don't we look at that? How does a ball round work? So I'm going to come over here and type ball round into this solution explorer. And sure enough, everything that has ball round in it pops up. There's this ballron.cs in the mobiles, monsters, humanoids, magic subfolders, right? I'm going to double click it. So this is what's in the ballron class. Um, so as soon as the ballron is constructed, this is the constructible attribute, basically means that I can spawn with a ballron. Um, in fact, why don't I jump in there and uh, actually uh, run Ultima Online. Let's see. Verifying account. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe. Oh, let's close that. Am I on a breakpoint? Oh, I'm on a breakpoint. That's why. So it's uh, it was sitting there, waiting for me to tell it to continue. There we go. All right. Keep it clean in the chat, please. I'd hate to have to kick anyone. Let's see here. It's connecting. I think it might have disconnected because of uh, that. Sometimes when you you get a bad in a bad state, there we go. Because uh, you didn't handshake basically with the server very well. Well, so you have here. Uh, I want to spawn a ball run. So I'm going to type the ball run, or I'm sorry, add the add command. Um, if you just type add, then it pops up these menus. This is all coded in the server, of course, and I could show you, you know, line by line if we wanted how that it builds this menu and it sends it to all the players. Um, so that you can kind of follow the menu if you want. I'm going to add a evil creature. It's a demon. It's a Balron, and there's a Balron. Or I could do add Balron, and by the name of the class, Balron, it knows what I'm talking about, of course, and it. It comes in here since Balron has this constructible attribute. It can actually construct one from the from the uh, um, from the uh, from within Ultima Online, right? And then it runs this code. So why don't I actually add a breakpoint? Let's see what this code does. And boom, the breakpoint has executed. Here I am on this line. The name it grabs a random name from the Balron uh, Balron name list. Um, so it grabs the name list, and there's the name list. Let's look what's in the name list. There's three three different strings in the name list: the Lord of the Abyss, the Collector of Souls, the Slayer. If we wanted, we can go we could go and uh, find that name list and change it to, you know, Gooberface or something, and and it could spawn with the name Gooberface. You know, whatever you can think of, whatever you want. So the body has changed. The body currently is zero. The initial value is zero. It changes to 40. What is 40? Well, 40 is the body identifier that's sent to you, the client, that tells you that this mobile looks like a Balron, or it looks like whatever your client. So if you went and changed your client file so that 40, no, <laughs> the body number 40 was like a, uh, a pig, you know, then it would be a pig, right? Uh, for you, for me, it, it would be whatever uh, you know, mine is. Base sound ID. This sound ID corresponds to a unique uh, client file. Again, when I when I, my guy makes a noise, when the ball run makes a noise on the server, I send a message that says, "Hey, you uh, you want you should need to play this 357 sound, and you will on your client. And if you haven't modified your client files, and it might sound like a ball run. Has some spellcast animation. Uh, there's the packets that contain that information of what the animation frame is and stuff, uh, you know, you can get pretty deep into that stuff if you if you wanted to. But anyway, they it changes depending on the mobile, um, and so it's important to set it correctly. So the strength, ever wanted to know? Ever wanted to know? You know how much strength the ball run had? Well, here it is in the code. 
My code might be a little different from the vanilla run UO. It's quite possible that that's the case. Ball run has 110 to 115 dexterity, has uh, well, 1800 to 2000 intelligence, has 10 to or 1000 to 1200 hits, uh, 1200 mana. The damage it does is 25 to 40 damage. It has virtual armor, which basically is like you had uh, uh, armor pieces on the entire body that give you vir uh, ten armor of 10. Sets his skills to tactics and eval. He has 100 tactics, you know, hits pretty hard. Tactics gives you, a, you know, damage boost. So we're setting all the skills. Has this much fame, this much karma. And those, of course, go into the calculation of how much you get uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, fame and karma when you kill him, right? All right, so that's, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm executing the code out of, uh, out of where oh let's see the message okay so the uh, I've executed the code out of that constructor so I was here I reached the end of the the block and now I'm back in the function that actually called that constructor block right so here I have this object that we just built it's the slayer object we can we can kind of browse in and see what's inside of it I don't know can you can you see that stuff? I don't know if the oh yep there it goes okay so you can see all these properties on this Slayer object well, we can find for example there's a lot of stuff and in fact I can show you <laughs> how big the base creature class is but uh, let's see, see if we can find the name la, 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 la. there's M name I think nope his name Oh, name is actually on the uh, subclass or the superclass of base creature, so it'd be even one level higher. In fact, from within UO, it's they have this really neat system. Of course, oh, I'm gonna have to hit play. And I'm probably gonna lose connection. Nope, I'm here. Where you can do props. Uh, it's a props command, and you can see the base creature class. So. Again, what's the base creature class about? Let me, let me give you a brief overview of that. So you see this Balron class? This code that's special to the Balron that makes it different from everything else. Um, it's pretty short, isn't it? You know, there's not a whole lot in there. It looks like real. <coughs> all I said is his strength and stuff, his skills, his fame. Um, there's this general loot function. This is uh, key to what we're going to do, you know, of course. Um, this can rummage corpse override basically the base the base class well, I'm gonna get to that well I'll, I'll explain that in a sec um, there's these serialize and deserialize functions which basically are used to convert this item this mobile this ball run into a string of, of binary data that then can be repopulated into when the server reboots from the save file into a new ball run right well, into a, a ball run that has these previously existing ball run properties, right? So anyway, th those are the deserialize and deserialize functions. Um, it gets a little bit hairy. Let me look. Let me show you real quick uh, a little bit uh, more complicated serialize and deserialize real quick, because I know that was a question someone had uh, regarding you know how it's stored. Um, let me find the pseudo seer stone. So the pseudo seer stone is an object that kind of con controls uh, all the pseudo seer stuff it keeps track of who's a pseudo seer and all that um, let me find a serialize so you can see the serialize function I write a number four because that's the version if you don't have a version number then you, how do you know what comes next like if I make a new version of the serial of this uh, of the pseudo seer stone how could I know for example that um, that I added five new variables in there, five new numbers that I need to read from this long string of the serialized string of data, um, I wouldn't know um, what to, how many, how many variables to read from that serialized string of data. I don't know what that data means, right? So the version is a Q. So when I call this a deserialized function, basically if the version is greater than or equal to four, I know that I have an extra double variable. A double is basically a decimal number that has, uh, you know, like 1.56789 is a decimal number, right? That could be stored as a double. Um, 
if origin is greater than or equal to three, I have an extra true or false value in that string of, of serialized data, right? If version is greater or equal to two, you know, and so forth. So it's important to actually keep track of the version, but then you are writing the data in the serialized function, and the deserialized function, you're essentially reversing that and reading the data. It's got to be the same order you wrote it in there, otherwise it'll, it'll uh, choke on you, and uh, it won't boot up. And I've had some, some uh, <laughs> many experiences, especially when I first started out, for example, on RailPoor, where you, know, you, you think everything's good to go, and then you boot things up, and it's asking you, oh, well, I couldn't deserialize the Balrons. Do you want to delete all the Balrons in the world? And you're like, uh... And you know that that makes for a high pressure coding situation, which is never fun, like my situation right now. <laughs> but anyway, no, it, this is fun. I'm enjoying this. I hope everyone else is enjoying this. Anyway, so that's a serialized function, and that's kind of a sidetrack. But you can see this Balron function or Balron class is actually pretty small. There's not much to it. But the reason that it actually does so much is because it's a subclass, meaning it inherits from a different class all of the properties and attributes of that class. So I'm going to press F12 here on the base creature and let's explore what's in the base creature. There's lots of properties, the active speed, the passive speed we can change to make him run super fast if we wanted, uh, the heal target, you know, all these combat uh, things, uh, whether or not he's controlled or not, what, who his master is, if he's a tamed creature, the loyalty, you know, what his loyalty level is, if that goes to zero then he will become untamed. You know, there's all sorts of information in this base creature class. Uh, it's maximum number of hit points, the maximum damage, minimum damage. It's all these AOS things that we actually don't use here. Um, you know, there's lots of things to keep track of. And so here's the constructor for the base creature. So as soon as you create a base creature, um, that uh, and it's not my poo code. It's this is the run uo code. <laughs> So you're not insulting me, though. There's I have my own crap in here, uh, here and there. So I guess I can take responsibility for some of this. But most of this base creature stuff is Run UO. The uh, team made this. So lots of stuff going on here. As soon as you you build, uh, yeah, Luthius probably had a hand in some of this stuff. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I gotta I gotta pay uh, pay attention to what's going on here. So as soon as you make a base creature. In fact, we can put a breakpoint in here, come back to my Balron, and I make a Balron, and guess what? It's running this code in here, because when you construct a Balron, it runs the constructor right here. So when you call this function, it actually calls the base function, so the constructor on the uh, super class, which is the base creature class. So this code right here put me right here. And these parameters here that I tell the AI type is generic AI and this is the closest fight mode which means fight the closest enemy and this is, what is this? Range perception so he can only see enemies up to 10 uh, up to 10 of the uh, 10 range, right? Uh, you have the fight range. How far can you swing? So if I change this to five, he'd, he could fight from five squares away. You know, the active speed again is uh, how fast he can run when he's mad at somebody. Passive speed is how fast he, how fast his AI ticks, than when uh, when he's not fighting somebody. Right. Anyway, so we can step through all this stuff. It's it's uh, a little bit longer than the. Balron uh, constructor code, but it sets the loyalty, it sets the AI type, it sets the range perception. So it's basically in initializing everything. Uh, it's initializing control master as nobody. It's not tameable. Changes the AI type. This AI it itself is pretty complicated. You, you can uh, get in there, and uh, the rabbit hole gets pretty deep again. Um, so it's setting the AI, it's creating this AI object, and the AI object has, of course, the, the, the properties, you know, next, next move, you know, has a lot of things on it that, that controls the AI, artificial intelligence of the, the mobs, right? Anyway, so we're, uh, we're, we're cruising along here. Um, so that is the base creature. And you can see that there's a lot more, and we we haven't even got down 
maybe even a, a tenth of the way of all the code in the base creature class. So I can I'm gonna keep pressing uh, page down, and you can see how many how many uh, things there are going on <laughs> in here. Uh, here's the get control chance, like how well or can you uh, control a creature that you have tamed? This is the function that that r runs the test of whether or not you can control it, right? Um, there's uh, the damage function. So the, da the damage function is called when you've done some damage to that creature. I'm going to put a breakpoint in there, and I'm still broke. I have a breakpoint running. Hit play. Ooh, automatic backup failed. Uh, so this was a warning because it couldn't write the uh, save file for some reason. So anyway, it caught the the exception. This is an exception, like I mentioned before. It caught the exception. It prints out where the the problem happened. It's really not nice for debugging because I can follow this. Actually, this looks like nonsense to most of you probably, but it uh, actually called um, from if you follow to the very end here. It's in the autosave file, line 86. You can go there, and that was called from line 138 of the autosave file and that was called from you know and so you can follow the path of the code execution figure out where the error was right anyway that's what's going on so uh, looks like I'm building a new base creature I probably have a spawner that's running right now so I'm gonna keep going there where did I put the breakpoint it was when I did damage right I'm gonna look for the damage there it is. So there's my breakpoint. So I'm going to see if my guy can uh, set all skills to a thousand. Okay, so I set all my skills to a thousand. Um, so I should be able to probably hit one of these guys. Um, so I'm going to hit him. Oh, hey, I hit him. Otherwise, I wouldn't have entered this damage function. So here I am. Uh, the old hits, it grabs the current number of hits. It runs the base dot damage function which is in the mobile class you see the ball <laughs> the base creature class inherits is a subclass of the mobile class and the mobile class is also pretty gigantic <laughs> um, but again you know this this might be discouraging you from like ever <coughs> getting interested I'm sorry getting interested in looking into digging into the stuff but honestly if you have something in mind that you want to know how it works you could do it uh, even though that uh, there's just tons of code here, right? You can do it with this F12 key, the go to re go to definition or declaration. Um, and the other one I haven't used yet um, is the find all references, uh, which I can show you right here. It's find all references. Basically, that prints every single place in your entire project where that particular function or that particular variable is accessed. To either you know if it's a function to call the function or to set the variable or to get the variable and use it somewhere so you can then dig through this list and figure out where is this function being used and uh, you know it's really helpful especially for debugging uh, purposes so anyway so we are in the damage function and the damage function of course does damage and you can see I did one damage because here my this dot hits is 1183 and the old hits was 1184 um, anyway it checks whether or not it's being controlled and the cre uh, subdue before tame must be some sort of I don't remember that it must be a later like AOS thing or something but if it involve if that uh, mechanic is being used then it will have a message uh, depending on what how many hits were done so there's this formula if the hits, the new hits are in some some way related to the old hits or the maximum number of hits that the creature has, they will display a message: the creature has been beaten into subjugation. All right. So anyway, that's the code. So <clears throat> I think that gives you maybe a, the gist of what um, how how the the process of of the program is executed and kind of how to navigate around a little bit and and change things. Um, I'm going to stop this. So I just closed the server.